Good evening and welcome to Slate School and our conversation with Sanjeev Chopra. Slate School is committed to excellence in education and we are delighted to present the Education Idea Lab, which is a new unique virtual series that is free and open to the public. This thought leading event convenes leaders, change makers and participants from all sectors of education and innovation. Thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled to have all of you with us here today. Uh, my name is Julie Mountcastle and I'm head of school at Slate School. Slate School is an independent 501c3 nonprofit elementary school where education is focused on cultivating creativity, fostering ingenuity, and inspiring a deep passion for lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. At Slate School, we have formed a community that is constantly striving to improve practice to create meaningful educational experiences for learners of all ages and to change the landscape in education. Slate School convenes experts for important, authentic conversations about education. And these online dialogues like tonight's are free and open to the public. So we are so delighted to have all of you with us this evening. I believe we have learners from all over the world with us um, and, and rightly so. Uh, because tonight's guest is quite remarkable. Um, Sanjeev Chopra is the author of five books, including Leadership by Example, The Ten Key Principles of All Great Leaders, uh, as well as his joint memoir with his brother Deepak Chopra called Brotherhood, and a wonderful um, a book about leadership. And he also has a book called The Two Most Important Days, um, which we're gonna talk about tonight as well. He is also professor of medicine and former faculty dean for continuing medical education at Harvard Medical School. In 2012, he was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor for exemplifying outstanding qualities in both one's personal and professional lives while continuing to preserve the richness of one's particular heritage. Sanjeev has has identified four fundamental habits for happiness, friends, forgiveness for others and gratitude. Our community at Slate School recognized the beauty and simplicity of Sanjeev Chopra's foundational values. And we began to find amazing ways to incorporate them in the life of the school and in our own lives as well. While remembering and referring to these seemingly simple practices, the children became confident that together we can create and sustain a community of kindness that embodies what we hope for the whole world. We are thrilled to have Sanjeev with us tonight. And we have so many questions and wonderings for him sent in by our community. And we also invite you to submit additional questions as comments on Facebook, and we'll select some of those questions to ask Sanjeev as well. So without further ado, welcome. Thank you so very much, Julie, for that very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be with all of you and share some reflections on topics I'm very passionate about. Well, let's get started because I know people are eager to hear from you. Um, I mentioned in the in the introduction that that Slate School has has adopted friendship, forgiveness for others and gratitude as these foundational um, ideals for happiness. And, and, you know, we thoroughly agree that that they are absolutely critical for a life, a joyful life. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, and I think I think some of the staff is curious too about how how you originally identified these as as the key tenets. So you know, I was invited to give a named lecture at Harvard Medical School called the Nathan Seidel Annual Lecture, and the person who invited me said, Sanjeev, you're a pretty interesting storyteller, so pick whatever topic you want to. Oh. I said, I'll get back to you tomorrow. And I called him and I said, how about I speak on dharma, happiness, and living with purpose? Because those three tenets are inextricably linked. And then I did a lot of research and talking to my amazing family and kids and grandkids who have so much wisdom and came up with those three Fs, friends, forgiveness for others, and the fourth one, not an F, a G, gratitude. So friends are our chosen family. I got very lucky with my parents and my one brother, amazing sibling. 
But I had no choice picking my parents for my sibling, but friends you can choose. James Rohn, a best-selling author, once said, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So choose your friends carefully, ones who have similar core values. Now there's an amazing study, it's called the Harvard Grant Study, is the longest lasting study on happiness. It's gone on for almost 80 years. There is no such study, right? Investigators die, funding disappears, 80 years. So 80 years ago, they took 700 sophomores, 250 went to Harvard. The others were from very poor neighborhoods, dysfunctional families in Dorchester, Roxbury, and they followed them. Detailed questionnaires, annual ex physical examinations, blood tests, EKG, C-reactive protein, functional MRI, home visits. Now a cohort of their children are being followed, 2000 of them. And what happened? Who was included in that group? And what happened to them? Some became CEOs, some became admirals, some became philanthropic individuals, <clears throat> some became skid row alcoholic derelicts, a few died of suicide. One became our president. John F. Kennedy was in that court. And the major conclusion of the study is that loneliness is toxic. And that your satisfaction with relationships with your friends at age 50 is a better predictor of health, happiness, and longevity three decades later at age 80. So choose your friends carefully and celebrate everything, small or big, with them. And I'll give you a lot of joy and bliss. Social connectedness, that's so important. Hard to do during this time of COVID-19, but we can do it. We can do it by Zoom. We can pick up the phone and call a dear friend. So that's number one. Second is ability to forgive. If somebody holds bitterness or rancor in their heart, they can never be happy. To me, the greatest example of forgiveness is Nelson Mandela, who served 27 years in prison. And when he's released, he's asked the question, Mr. Mandela, do you have a resentment against your captors? He said, I have no bitterness. I have no resentment. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. You know, Gandhi once said, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. The Buddha said, if you hold resentment, it's like holding a hot coal with the intent of hurtling it at somebody who offended you. That person's moved on while you're burning your hand. So anyone listening, if you're holding a grudge against an ex, a sibling, a neighbor, a colleague at work, my plea to you, get rid of it. And the moment you make that decision, you will feel this enormous weight come off your shoulders. So friends, forgiveness. The third one, Albert Schweitzer, physician, theologian, humanitarian, Nobel laureate, 1952, he gets a Nobel Peace Prize and talk about humility. At the ceremony, he said, now I have to go earn it. Now I have to go earn it. And he once said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I'm certain of, the ones amongst you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found out to serve. There's this whole concept now of servant leadership. Leaders are there to serve. So I've distilled it into those three S, friends, forgiveness for others. The fourth one is gratitude. And there's research to back this. Robert Emmons, considered one of the fathers of modern positive psychology, has written a small book called Thanks. Talks about a study he did in which he randomized a large group and half of them were told to jot down three things at the end of the day that they did during the day. And the other half to jot down three things they were grateful for. And the group that wrote about gratitude, that set point of happiness went up by an astounding 25%. Nice. So very simple, low tech, take a notebook, call it your gratitude journal, put your name on it. And even if you don't want to do it once every, every day, once a week on Sunday evening, as you're looking at what's in store for you the next week, reflect on what happened, transpired in the last seven days, and you'll be amazed how many things you'll recall for which you're grateful for and write it down. But happiness is more than the sum total of happy moments. 
And in order for us to have sustained happiness, we have to find our purpose and live it. So that's the title of the book, The Two Most Important Days, which I wrote with a friend and colleague, uh, Gina Weld. When I was the faculty dean for continuing education at Harvard Medical School, she was the associate dean of external communications. We did a lot of work together. And, uh, she met my wife, I met her family, <clears throat> and we wrote this book. And then I came up with the name, Two Most Important Days, How to Find Your Purpose and Live a Healthy and Happy Life because there are more than 25,000 books out there with the word happiness in the title. Yeah. So this is based on a wonderful quote by Mark Twain, who once said, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Each one of us has a singular purpose in life. We're lucky to find it and live it. We are the happiest people on this planet. And it can be done, it, you reflect, it will come to you. There's one other technique, which I teach in a workshop, which is to take, give everyone 30 three by five index cards and say at the end of every day for the next 30 days, jot down three, four, five things you did and give it a rating. Where one, you were miserable, 10, if you were lucky, you were in bliss. There'll be lots of four, five, six, seven, threes. At the end of a month, Put those cards in a line, strike off everything between one and five. Six, seven, eight, nine made you happy, gave you joy. Your purpose is lurking in there. You'll find it. Wow, that's fantastic. I think uh, I think there's going to be a run on index cards at Slate School this week. <laughs> and maybe all over the world, you never know. Um, wow, that's that's fantastic. And I know I, I know I'm, I, we're all very interested in, in, in the two most important days. I think that's a, a beautiful title for for a beautiful piece of work. So I guess my question is, why did you think that book was needed? You know, why, why, why are we so struggling toward having this? You know, that's a great question, Julie. If you look at it, there's an annual rating of the happiest countries every year. <clears throat> and America, our country, the country we love, comes in 23rd, 19th, 26th. We are the richest, most powerful country in the world. And we have, uh, you know, brilliant people. It's the land of innovation and science and Nobel laureates. Why aren't we happy? I think we're looking in the wrong places. We're looking for happiness outside. If you or I tomorrow get a brand new luxury car or we move into a huge mansion, you know, we'll be happy for three, four, five months. At the end of that, it's a car. It's a place you go to sleep and eat, entertain, and you get used to it. This phenomenon is called hedonic adaptation. You know, like hedonism, hedonic mm -hmm. adaptation. So most of us, I think, unfortunately, are looking at the wrong things. Happiness is an inside job, not outside. And we need to look inward. And it's very simple, those th three Fs, friends, forgiveness for others, gratitude. And then if you find your purpose. So that was the reason I was thinking about it. I gave the talk, then I gave it around the country. I gave it in Australia and in India and in Singapore, Kuwait, multiple countries, and then people would come up and say, do you have a book on this? So that was the reason for writing the book. Yes. So um, that's, that's great. Um, I, think, I think we'd do better in the world if we had more people that waited until the book was wanted to write it. <laughs> there are a lot of books out there. Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit just about about your own leadership journey. I mean, obviously there's nobody that's been listening for the last few minutes who doesn't recognize, you know, what a great leader you are. Um, but I'm just curious, do you feel like you were born to this or do you feel like this is something that evolved? And if it did, how did it? So, you know, <clears throat> I, I believe that leaders are not born, leaders can be made. There's nothing in the DNA of certain people that they're destined for leadership and that the rest of us are clueless and we're never going to be able to lead. So 
I was appointed the faculty dean for continuing education at Harvard Medical School some 20 years ago. And I said to myself, what an awesome responsibility. And when I first, after multiple interviews and when I was selected, then I had uh, coffee with Joe Martin, who was the head dean. And I said to him, I said, Joe, I'm honored, I'm privileged. What an amazing <clears throat> position of responsibility you have bestowed upon me. But for leadership, one needs two elements, not only responsibility, but also authority. And if you have authority, but no responsibility, you're a tyrant. And if you have responsibility, but no authority, it's martyrdom. And I said, I'm not ready for either. <laughs> so he looked at me, he said, I love the way you articulated it. You have both, you yeah. have a lot of authority. If it's a huge amount of money or something you want to invest, please check with me or the Dean of Finance. But otherwise they give you all the authority and the responsibility. <clears throat> the other, <clears throat> so I, I, before taking that job, I'm a speed reader. I read like 200 books on leadership and many of them were not at all good. The leadership principles of Attila the Hun, oh. you know, but there were some really good books. And then I did a lot of talking with my brother, with colleagues at Harvard Business School, the Kennedy School, the Ed School, <laughs> my amazing colleagues, professors <clears throat> about leadership. I asked Deepak Jain, who is a legendary dean at the Kellogg School of Management, one of the top five management schools in the world, if not number one, some years it's number one. And I asked him, I said, Deepak, what's the difference between managers and leaders? We need both, right? He said, absolutely. He said, managers are for today, leaders are for tomorrow. Hmm? Managers do things right, leaders do the right things. So we need both. And you don't have to have a title to be a leader. CEO, chancellor, dean, president, the title does not bestow upon you leadership qualities. And they can be amazing leaders without ever having a title. So then I love mnemonics, alliterations, limericks, metaphors, and I travel a lot and I do a lot of my writing on airplanes. And I came up with the mnemonic for leadership, which spells out leadership. So then the book came around. I'd given again a talk, a keynote in Anaheim, six, 7,000 clinicians. And again, the question was, why don't you have a book on it? Do you have a deep? <laughs> so that's how I wrote the book. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's great. I think I, I, maybe I need to give a talk somewhere and see if I could write a book too. I don't know. I'm not ready. So I want to say this, Julie, everyone, including you, if you haven't done it yet, Everyone listening has at least one good book in them. And everyone has at least one good TED talk in them. So I'm sure you're passionate about something. I'm sure your life story is unique. And you owe it to the rest of us to write a book. Oh, Voltaire, our... the French philosopher, once said, every man is guilty of all the good he did not do. Isn't that a great saying? That's a great You have a skill or a talent and you don't share it. You right. should be guilty, right? He also said another great quote, cherish those who seek the truth, but beware of those who find it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, I, I, there are so many things I want to ask you now that are not on, you know, that, that I just, I could go on a thousand tangents at this moment, but the one I want to ask you about now is about humor. You're a funny guy. And I wonder, um, I, I wonder where, where does humor fit in, 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 in the leadership hierarchy and where does it fit in the happiness? Hierarchy? Yeah. So humor in the leadership mnemonic, 
L is listening and H is humor and humility. And all the great leaders have had humor. Gandhi was once asked uh, by a Western reporter after a brutal beating of thousands of Indians and some deaths, Gandhi ji, what do you think about Western civilization? And he answered right away, he said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Ronald Reagan, when he was shot and he's bleeding in the lung, he's got a hemothorax and he's been taken to the operating room and he's sounded, surrounded. The chief of cardiothoracic surgery was this towering six foot seven inch tall surgeon, trauma team, blood bank people, nurses, cardiologists, lung specialists. He's being wheeled into the operating room. He says, stop, I have a very important question to ask. So they all said, yes, President Reagan. He goes, are all of you Republicans? <laughs> At which point the leader of the team gave the best answer. He said, President Reagan, today we are all Republicans. Benjamin Disraeli and William Gladstone were arch rivals and successive prime ministers in England. And there's a quote attributable to Prime Minister Disraeli about misfortune. And the next day a woman reporter is interviewing him and she says, Prime Minister Disraeli, what's the di difference between misfortune and calamity? And without skipping a beat, he says, well, if Gladstone were to fall into the thins, that would be a misfortune. But if someone were to drag him out, it would be a national calamity. <laughs> It endears you when you hear somebody with good humor, clean humor, wit. So that's a sign of leadership. And humility is a sign of leadership. I mean, you know, I, <clears throat> I've been reflecting recently about different kinds of courage. And I was thinking, okay, there's physical courage. That's brute physical courage. Shackleton the expedition to the Antarctica or a blind man climbing Mount Everest or a double amputee, but there's moral courage, right? Moral courage of the Gandhis, the Nelson Mandela's, the Martin Luther King Juniors, the young people of the Arab Spring, Tunisia and Egypt, the Greta Thunbergs of the world. Then there's spiritual courage like Mother Teresa, but there's also philanthropic courage. And I'm defining philanthropy as love for humanity. Very simple, love for humanity. We have an individual in our country. I didn't know about him till about a month ago. His name is Chuck Feeney. He's close to 80 years of age. He, had donate, he has donated $8 billion to charity. Anonymously. Now it's come out. And he uh, has now given 100% of his wealth to charity. Not 50, 75%, 90%. He set aside $2 million for him and his wife's retirement. He's championed something called <clears throat> giving while living, right? Not in a foundation, who knows what will happen with that. Giving while living. Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, I'm told, hold him in the highest esteem. This is the greatest philanthropist of our time. That's philanthropic courage. It's pretty amazing. Yes, absolutely. Um, Sanjeev, you have, I think you must have some kind of an incredible memory because when I listen to you talk, you have, you know, just, any quote from uh, you know a hundred different people in in your in your mind ready to be called upon. It's it's quite you remarkable. Get, you know I'm I'm I comment on that to myself and to my family. I say I'm so lucky. I I don't know. I inherited it from my father, my grandfather, my uncles. My brother has a great memory, and it's held me, of course, in good stead in in medicine. Something that I learned in medical school. I can recount it to this day since one patient with this rare disease, I remember. Wow. But these quotes as well, just come to me. And when I'm writing or speaking, 
um, I'm very fortunate that I can remember all of those. Such a beautiful gift. It's a really beautiful yes, I'm lucky. Gift. Um, but I, I'm grateful. <laughs> you're grateful. Yeah, and you're happy. Um, I'm, I, I have two questions about quotes. I, there, there's one quote that's in your, um, in your book about leadership that I, I haven't been able to get out of my head after I reread it. And it's, um, it's the Thomas More quote. Um, and I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up because I don't have your memory. Um, when a man takes an oath, he's holding his own self in his hands like water. And if he opens his fingers, then he needn't hope to find himself again. So beautiful, isn't it? It's remarkable. It, well, it's, it's, it's spectacularly terrifying, actually. It is. But what it says is that as an individual, as a company, as a country, as a corporation, as an institution, you could do things with great integrity, morality, humanity for decades. And then one day you compromise your value. You open your hands and the water spills. You've tarnished your reputation for life. One of my favorite quotes along those lines is by Heraclitus, the great Greek poet and philosopher who once said, the soul is dyed the color of its thoughts. Think only those things that are in line with your principles and can bear the full light of day. Day by day, what you think, what you choose, and what you do is who you become. Your integrity is your destiny. It is the light along the path. Your integrity is your destiny. So I think both those two are very similar. One is long, one is so simple and profound. They're connected, definitely, definitely connected. Um, so my other question about a quote is, what, what quote would you like for other people to use of yours? How would you like for me to quote you? <laughs> what, what's your what's your what's your favorite uh, piece of wisdom that I can that I can memorize because you're inspiring. Well, I think um, there are so many great quotes, uh, and I do want to tell a story about Gandhi and a twelve-year-old boy. Let's have it. Leadership by example. Uh, one of my favorite. I mean, there's so many. There's the Dalai Lama. Be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. How good is that? How simple is it? Right? And then there is, we talked about courage. There is Soren Kierkegaard again, who said, today is to lose one's footing momentarily. Not today is to lose oneself. How good is that? You gotta be daring, right? Now I'll share with you the story of Gandhi and the 12 year old boy. Gandhi is sitting in his ashram and this mother walks with her 12 year old son about 12, 15 miles in the heat and the dust. And she says to Gandhi, she says, Gandhiji. So when you add the word J-I after somebody's name, it's a sign of reverence. Gandhiji, my son adores you. He worships you. He'll do anything for you. Look at him. He's gained so much weight. Would, he's eating a lot of sugar. Would you please tell him not to eat sugar? So Gandhi looks up at the boy and the mother and he says, come back in 10 days. So they go away. 10 days later, they trudge again in the heat and the dust. And Gandhi looks at the boy. He says, son, don't eat sugar. It's not good for you. And the boy says, Gandhiji, from this moment onwards, I have given up sugar. And he leaves the room. And the mother stays behind and says, Gandhiji, thank you for saying that to my son. But can I ask you a question? We were here 10 days ago and you could have said the same thing to my son then. And Gandhi whispers into her ear, at that time, I had not given up sugar. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Oh. That is leadership by example. Yes. Not do as I say, but do as I do. That is leadership by example. Beautiful. Beautiful story. Incredible. Um, so obviously this is the Education Idea Lab. So I have to, I have to ask, um, 
how do you learn? What kind of a learner are you? And, and what have you learned recently? So I'm, an, I'm a voracious reader and I read maybe two books a week on average. And I'm a bit of a speed reader, but one of the, and I've been gifted three Kindles and I've gifted them away. So I like to hold the book. And when I read something and I, I have an aha moment, I encircle it or put asterisks. Then I go to the back inside cover and I write page 17, page 24, page 27, page 32. And then six months later, I open the back cover and I revisit those pages. And it's incredible, Julie, how much you have subconsciously absorbed and maybe made part of your routine, your life, your lifestyle, your thinking, your behaving from something amazing that you read. I put on Facebook once, the person who does not read has no advantage over the person who cannot read. And one of my friends, I won't mention whom, very, very accomplished, called me. He said, Sanjeev, I used to read one book every week. I haven't read for five years. You've put me to shame. I'm starting to read every week now. <laughs> but we should read and, and expand our horizons. The other thing along those lines is back to James Rohn. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. We can all create what I learned actually at Unite for Sight annual meeting two years ago when I was on the panel after I'd given my talk. And there was a very wonderful learned individual and people were asking questions. And he said, I suggest to you that you form your own personal advisory group, like the advisory boards. So take friends, three or four friends who live in the neighborhood and meet with them once a month and sit down and say, I'm facing this challenge. I'm thinking of writing a book. I'm thinking of giving a TED talk, whatever. And they will come in with wonderful wisdom and advice. And ideally choose people outside your profession. So I told a cardiologist, I, he was asking me about this and I said, if you do this and the other four friends are all cardiologists, you might have some very interesting heart to heart talks, <laughs> but it's not going to be as good if you have a philanthropist, a businessman, a landscape architect, a lawyer, they'll bring a different perspective to the discussion. Very simple thing for us to do, right? And most of us hesitate. Oh, how can I ask this person for help or advice? He or she is so busy. You know, it's a badge of honor to get great ideas from someone else. That's what Jack Welch once said. It's a badge of honor to get great ideas from somebody else. So there's so much wisdom out there and we can learn from every single human being on this planet. There's something to teach us. But that personal advisory group resonated for me. I used to belong to something called a mastermind group and then it dwindled over the years and now I've rekindled this personal advisory group. Nice. Um, I, I, I actually, I, I have a note in my notebook about that exact moment that you're talking about there. So yeah. I was there to write, I, I, I actually, that made an impact on me too. Yeah. So sitting in the same room. Yeah. Um, so, so thinking about the personal advisory group, I'm wondering if, if there is someone in your life who has been a mentor for you. Oh yeah, so, so many of them. Um, now, <clears throat> of course they include my parents and my grandparents and uncles, my brother, but in the, my professional career, I had some amazing teachers and mentors. And when I first gave my talk on leadership, which before it became a book, I invited four of them. So they're 20 years older than me, 25 years older than me, professors, tenured, deans, 
the first dean of continuing education at Harvard Medical School, Dan Federman, legendary, iconic endocrinologist, brilliant. So I wrote to all of them, email, and said, I've developed a talk on leadership. I haven't given it. In three months or two months, I'm giving it as a keynote at Anaheim conference, three-day conference, one morning. Expected attendance is 7,000. I would be honored if I can come to your office, show you my presentation and have you critique it. And Julie, all four of them said, no, we'll come to your office. And they came and then I showed it and I gave them a notebook with a pen said, please take notes and critique it. And uh, because I also want to time it. So if you interrupt in the middle, then we won't be sure. Right. They all did that. And then when the book came out, I thanked all of them, plus some of my other teachers for packing my parachute. It's a talk that Captain Charlie Plum, a prisoner of war, gives around the country. He's given it as a keynote in my update in internal medicine course in December, where we get 500 doctors from 45 countries. And he got a standing ovation. He was 76 years of age. And when he finished, we were having coffee. I said, Captain Plum, you have taken speaking and acting lessons. He says, Sanjeev, I give 75 talks a year. But on the weekend, I'm back home. And I still have a Shakespearean director every weekend coach me. Can you imagine this guy's at the pinnacle, Hi. getting standing ovations, charging $20,000 for a talk, giving 75 talks and workshops. And yet he wants to be better. So in my talk on leadership in Anaheim, I happened to get a standing ovation and I said, ladies and gentlemen, please sit down. Captain Charlie Plum, whose story I told you about is in the audience. Captain Plum, would you please take a bow? And 7,000 people got up and cheered and applauded him. I said, he wrote a book, it's called, I'm No Hero. He's a true American hero. And then I say, each one of you is here because somebody packed your parachute. You may have been a teacher, a parent, a sibling, a neighbor, a friend, and your job as a leader now is to do two things. Number one, pack other people's parachutes. And number two, thank those who packed your parachute. And my plea to you, don't wait for the eulogy. And Captain Plum, he did this. And then when we were having coffee, he said, Sanjeev, that was brilliant. Not to wait for the eulogy. Many of us forget to do that. Can I use it? I said, of course you can. <laughs> and then I mentioned it to a dear friend of mine, Bob Carithers, who's a professor of medicine, eminent liver specialist. And they were vacationing at Martha's Vineyard. They came from Seattle, stayed with us. We've gone straight with them. And I mentioned this to him, don't wait for the eulogy. And he did that. And then he called me two weeks later from Seattle. He said, you know, Hal Fallon in Virginia is the one who nurtured my career and packed my parachute. So I wrote him a letter and I thanked him. And I got a letter back from him saying, I was crying when I got your letter. Because we forget to say thank you, right? To people who nurtured our careers. So very powerful. Uh, by the way, people listening, you can Google Captain Charlie Plum and watch part of his talk. Brilliant. Well, that's, that's a very, inspiring story. Um, I, I wonder with all this great, with all these great models, with all these, you know, incredibly beautiful humans who have been incredible, inspiring leaders. Um, what's, why aren't, why aren't we able to do it? Why, why is it hard? What, what is the challenge to being a good leader? I think the challenge is first saying to yourself, I have within me the talents, the skills, the wherewithal to be a leader. I'm defining leadership as the ability to articulate a vision 
and walk the path such that it inspires others to rise above the banality and strife of their common day existence and achieve a higher and common goal. Now, we, we don't have to be the greatest leaders like Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Winston Churchill, so many young people, Jennifer Staple, amazing leader, um, inspiring leader. I write about her in my book on leadership. But we can lead at many different levels. You can lead in your neighborhood. You can lead in your church, in your synagogue, in your place of worship. You can lead in the Rotary Club, in the Lions Club, in the Garden Club. Many, many different levels. And it's a journey, not a destination. Once you start doing it and follow some of those principles, you know, leadership, spelling, listening, empathy, compassion, daring to dream big, being effective, being resilient, having a sense of purpose, humility, integrity, and packing others' parachutes. Follow some of those principles, your leadership will rise. And it's one of the most fulfilling and gratifying things one can do. You know, the greatest thrill for most of us, and I'm sure it's gonna be at Slate School for the teachers and for you, is when you see these children grow up and then 20 years from now, some of them uh, are surpassing us and doing amazing things. My greatest thrill is when one of my students, one of my fellows, when I joined the Beth Israel 35 years ago, they are now chiefs of divisions at Stanford. You know, Steve Friedman was my fellow. He's a professor at Harvard Medical School. Brilliant. I, it's such a thrill. I have a definition of, somebody asked me once, what's, what's a great leader? You define leadership, what's a great leader? I said a great leader, like a great teacher, makes himself or herself progressively redundant. The followers take over and do a much better job. Now, what do followers look for in leaders? It turns out they look for four things. Stability, empathy, compassion, trust, and hope. So I have this mnemonic, SET, S-E-T-H, stability, empathy, trust, and hope. Napoleon was asked to define a leader. He said, a leader is a dealer in hope. So that's what enlightened leaders do. The other way some people lead, and that's what tyrants like Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin did, was fear mongering. That doesn't work in the long run. Works for a while. So any one of us can lead and lead in exemplary ways. One of your one of the one of the quotes in your book, the one of the other quotes that I, I was struck by was the, the Thomas Edison quote about yeah. um, uh, that the invention of the light bulb was basically a two thousand step process. Yeah. Amazing, right? That one thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine steps previous yeah. to the last one were all just mistakes. Yeah. And I, I wonder what, what you hope you take away from that. I think what you take away from that is that the key ingredient, there are two key ingredients to success. The first one is being happy. Albert Schweitzer said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you're happy, you're more creative. You sleep better. You have better interpersonal relationships. So that's number one. Number two is having grit. And Angela Duckworth did research, West Point graduates, people who win spelling bees, all kinds of groups. And the most successful people in all those different disciplines are the people who have grit, which we can define as having passion and perseverance. Perseverance, passion and perseverance for a long-term articulated goal. Edison had that, right? He didn't stop. He kept working at it. And when asked, how did it feel to fail 9,999 times? He said, I didn't fail. I figured out 9,999 ways in which it doesn't work. And when he was 57, his factory burned down and his friends were commiserating with him. And he said, why are you sympathizing with me? All my mistakes are burned down and now I can start anew. 
See, it's attitude even more important than aptitude. Mm -hmm. It's having that grit and being happy. Have you made some spectacular mistakes? Oh yeah, but I'm not admitting them tonight on television or Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, so I, I guess I want to ask what's what's next? What's well, you know, I've been writing, I happen to have at this stage written um, 12 books. And um, during this COVID lockdown, last year, I, I happened to be in 10 countries. This year, in January, end of December, January, I was in India, then I was in Dominican Republic, and then I was in St. Lucia. And then March came, hold on. So I reached out to a, a colleague of mine, Martin Abramson, he's brilliant. He's a renowned endocrinologist, diabetologist. And for years I've been telling him, Martin, you need, should write a book on diabetes for the lay public. Mm -hmm. He says, Sanjeev, there are books out there. I said, it doesn't matter. There's always new stuff. You're at Harvard, you're brilliant. There's a stem cells and new medications and microbiome. So I called him at the end of March and I said, hey, let's write this book. And his wife would tell him every time we had dinner, listen to Sanjeev, Marty, write a book. So we're both at home, right? We're working by Zoom. So there's something called Starleaf. And he and I would get on Starleaf. We could see each other, hear each other. And we worked every day for two or three hours, every single day. No. I would have a draft on a chapter, let's say the promise of stem cells and curing type 1 diabetes, we'd put it up, I'd say, Martin, I don't like the way I wrote chapter, paragraph two, let's reword it. He said, I didn't like it either. <laughs> so we'd redo it, let's say paragraph five should come before four. Let's look up the top 10 stem cell institutes in the world. Why is Doug Melton, who heads the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, so passionate about finding a cure for type 1 diabetes? He has two sons, both have type one diabetes, they're on insulin. Three hours later, that draft, Julie, has become a chapter. We finished the book in 90 days. Wow. Now with my literary agent, and she sent it to 15 people. We have endorsements from 20 amazing deans and world famous diabetologists from all over the world. And then we have many, many stories in the book. Storytelling, is the most powerful thing one can do. Steve Jobs once said, the most powerful people in the world are storytellers. So Martin, my dear friend, he's like a younger brother to me. He's originally from Johannesburg and Cape Town, but we've been friends and we worked together for more than 25 years. Had a 92 year old patient and we had to come and present at a annual update in internal medicine seven day course when she was 90 and she got a standing ovation. And her story is that when she was six years of age, growing up in Canada, she was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So she needed insulin. Insulin had just come out five years earlier, Banting and Best, discovery of insulin. So her mother gave her insulin, never thought she'd have a full life, homeschooled her, but she got married. Her husband was an amazing guy, consultant, took her all over the world with the insulin injections. She got complications of retinopathy, kidney disease, celiac disease. Um, she became a champion in Canada of some sport, curdling, curdling. Oh, really? And lived to 92. And Martin calculated that she took 120,000 injections of insulin. What an amazing story. So we put that story. Every chapter has a story of one of our patients. So our patients inspire us. You know, when you were talking about learning, it's a lifelong privilege. And in medicine, we learn from CME courses, from journals, from colleagues, from weekly meetings, from students. 
but we also learn from our patients. That's an amazing privilege. That's incredible. Um, is there a book you're hoping somebody will write? Is there something you'd like to hear about in the world? What do you, what do you, what do you want to read? I want to read about how we're finally there and there's world peace. That if somebody writes a book and, and it's already happened or we are on that trajectory, that would be amazing. The other would be if we have conquered hunger and poverty. You know, um, I think it was Gandhi again who said there are people so hungry in this world that God appears to them in the form of bread. And Mohammed Yunus from Bangladesh, who got the Nobel Peace Prize for starting micro loans, giving mm -hmm. it to poor people at very low interest rate. He said, uh, there is no place for poverty in a civilized society, you know, it's anathema. And if we could get rid of poverty, if we could get rid of wars, that would be amazing. That would just be amazing. And people sometimes say, well, the major reason for conflict in the world is poverty. I don't subscribe to that. I think it's poverty of dignity. If I offend you, you will recoil. If I offend another tribe, they will recoil. If I def defile or do something demeaning to another society or a country, it's natural for them to want to get back at you. So we need to treat people with compassion and dignity. I'd like to read that. I think the future are our children, the young people, because they are colorblind. They play with other kids, they love to, they hug. They have no biases and prejudices. <laughs> and then they grow up and we adults have ruined it for them. Yeah. You know, there's a wonderful quote by Rabindranath Tagore, who was a Nobel laureate in literature. In 1912, he wrote a series of poems in his native language, Bengali. Next year, he translated it into English. Anyone listening, if you like poetry, you ought to read this. Gitanjali means an offering. And he once said, every child comes with the message that God is not yet discouraged of man. How good is that? Right? With all the wars and killings, every child comes with the message, God is not yet discouraged of man. There's hope. There's hope. There's hope. <laughs> We, we have very little time left, sadly, but I, I, I thought I'd just, I'd just offer you an opportunity to give us maybe one last thing. You know, if, if, if there was only one thing a person was taking away from, from this conversation, what, what would you want them to take away? I would say happiness is your birthright. It's in our DNA. We are hardwired for happiness. Truly, if you and I were at a cocktail party and we were talking and suddenly we heard in the adjacent room loud laughter. We'd say, hey, let's check out what's going on there, right? Yes. We gravitate, it's a natural instinct. And if we're happy, we're gonna be more fulfilled, we're gonna be more peaceful. So let's all be happy and make others happy. And one of the best ways of being happy is to make others happy. Very simple formula. So if there was a lot of happiness in the world, the happiest countries year after year after year are Denmark and Finland, Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, Bhutan, small country in the foothills of the Himalayas. You know, they have a ministry of happiness. Their ruler in Bhutan 35 years ago said, we're not gonna care about GDP. We're gonna care about gross happiness product. 
and they keep track of every citizen's happiness every year. The goal is to increase it. Now it's a small country, it's doable, but there's no reason why we can't do it. We, we need to be happier and we need to look for the right things. We talked about hedonism, the flip side, human beings are so resilient, right? And they can bounce back. To me, the most impressive, one of the most impressive stories is that of Superman, right? The actor, Christopher Reeves, oh. taking part in an equestrian competition, the horse buckles, he goes flying, breaks his neck and he's paralyzed. He had an amazing dedicated wife and friends. And here's what he said. Initially he was unhappy. Why did this God do it to me? But here's what he said before the year was over. He said, this is not the life I imagined, but there is happiness, there is joy, there is laughter, there is purpose. He used these words, amazing. There was the editor of the French magazine Elle and at 43, he got a very unusual stroke where every muscle in his body is paralyzed. He's fully awake, but he's paralyzed. The only muscle he can do is blink one eyelid, one eyelid. He blinked the eyelid 200,000 times and wrote a book. While he blinked, his secretary sat, blinked three times, it meant C. The book became a play. It was nominated for four Oscars. It became a movie. It's called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And two days after the play was released, he passed away. It's like my purpose is done. Yes. Talk about resilience and human beings. Remarkable. Remarkable. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a risk and share a quote with you that you probably already know. And yeah. I'm going to share it with you because as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, we're, we're on the right track here with our kids. Because I, I don't know if you, you probably can't see, but on the board over here, yeah. there's, there's a quote up there and it says, rivers do not drink their own water, trees do not eat their own fruit, the sun does not shine on itself, and flowers do not spread their fragrance for themselves. Living for others is a rule of nature, no matter how difficult it is. Life is good when you are happy, but much better when others are happy because of you. Wow, beautiful. Who's, who's that from? No, that's Pope Francis. Oh, I love it. St. Francis of Assisi had some of the best quotes. He said, for it is in the giving that we receive. My favorite is, Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. <laughs> right? How good is that? And so, you know, but we can also learn from children and we can learn from fictional characters. So there's, you know, Peanuts, the comic strip, Snoopy and Charlie Brown sitting, looking at the sunset and Charlie Brown says, we only live once. And Snoopy says, wrong. We only die once. We live every day. Look at the wisdom. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, great. Well, Sanjeev, it has been um, just a, an incredible joy to have you here. Uh, you've so increased all of our happiness. Um, sincerely, just what a wonderful evening. What a wonderful hour. Thank uh, you. And, and I hope that I hope that we've inspired leaders here. I hope oh, people yeah. listen. I hope that um, people understand the kind of joyful life that's that's possible for all of us, and 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 work on it, work on it Great. through gratitude and all of the things that you mentioned. We're we're lucky to have your. Uh, we're you. lucky to have you. We're lucky to have you. You inspired us all. Thank so, you. I'll just, right. Stay happy and healthy. Thank you. You too. This concludes the time we have for this conversation. Uh, we're grateful to. Sanjeev for his generous sharing of all this wisdom. It's been so insightful and I'm sure everyone is feeling energized. Uh, to you is what we've heard here tonight. I hope so. I'd say thank you again and again. And as we say, as we close all of our meetings here at Slate School, positive rice to all of you. Positive rice to everyone. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Thank Have you. a great evening, morning, whatever. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. Any anytime you're with us. Yeah. Thank you. All Thank right. You. All the best. All the best. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.